You notice no fingers in the mouth, right? It's just like Do you know how long that took me to learn that? When he was a little boy, he practiced in bed. In bed to practice. I learned it. Okay, no more. Well, Greetings and welcome to this wonderful day. The weather sure cooperated. Cleaned up nicely for your attendance here tonight. Thank you all for being here. We love to see you, and we have a wonderful crowd and a wonderful turnout. A great program coming up. A couple of administrative items. We have not had a meeting now for four months. Or actually, no, that's not true. We had one for nine days. So we did well. We had to, we took the summer off. In any case, we had a wonderful time in Thorndale for our annual tea back in June. Um, unfortunately, I, can, I have to report to you that we had an unfortunate and very unexpe unexpected resignation of one of our uh, society officers, Bill Jackson, an enthusiastic young man who lives over in, High, uh, over in Pleasant Valley with his wife, family, and so on. And Bill has just taken on a new job with Pleasant Valley Federal Credit Union. And there's a family involved and so forth. And Bill just got to a point where he was just really out of sight. So, he says, Danny says, I just can't continue right now. I'll be back sometime in the future. So, with regret, we have accepted his resignation. At the same time, I'm very pleased to announce to you that tonight your board affirmed and voted unanimously to put in Bill Jackson's place Susan Parshon. Where is Susan Parshon? Right there. He's a great, very good man, but Susan, by the way, Susan jumped in at the last minute. We, I was notified the last week in August, Red Fork Community Day, which was kind of freaking tiny, but Bill couldn't avoid the time. Susan jumped in and she did the September and October newsletters. Literally without direction, she just took over and ran with it. So it's, yes, obviously she's an asshole for the job. And she's accepted graciously and we're glad to have you aboard to help her voice. Okay, um, we had a very sad event. Uh, this past summer, I think most of you are aware, our former president, uh, Lori Duncan, passed away of, uh, well, it and uh, a long time of uh, illness and fighting over the uh, past couple of years, and uh, she was enthusiastic right up to the very end. I miss Lori sincerely. Uh, there was excellent representation on the part of this society, and her flowers and everything, and We've done something above that. Tonight, your board has approved uh, unanimously again the naming or renaming of our annual scholarship fund given to a local high school graduate from Millbrook High School. It's now going to be known henceforth as the Glory Duncan Memorial Award. And uh, we already have a, um, a nice little um, money pot going so far, but we want to double what we have, and I'm not going to tell you what the goal is, but if you have penny banks, a couple of extra dollars in your pocket, just think of the contributions that Lori has made to this society over the years, and what a wonderful way to recognize her and to thank her, even though she happens to be good. So I will offer that for your consideration, and Jim Sweeney is our treasurer. Uh, any one of our officers, he's back there with the general with the camera, and any one of our officers, including myself, will be willing to accept checks or cash or whatever it is that you would like to use, uh, contribute to that award. We had a successful community day. We were looking at it in the Village Green. I'm not sure we should be able to the Village Green next year, so we probably will move back to Franklin Avenue, but I can report we served 400 free servings of ice cream. And uh, we did bring in the number of people I thought we would, but boy, that ice cream went like fury. It was great. We, we gave out historic charge and historic family. Yeah. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> Thanks, bud. Okay, fine. All right, that was great. Boy, but it was a lot of, it was a lot of fun and a good time had by all. By the way, the, the difference from the ice cream? Students from the National Honor Society from Milford High School and one from F from Five Awards, Lady Awards. And uh, oh, by the way, I got a village of village presidents that happens to go to awards. So the kids got involved, they were enthusiastic, they were a lot of fun, they had a lot of laugh and joke and so forth. So it was a very, very good day for all. But we probably will move back on to Franklin Avenue next year. 
Uh, in the works right now, talked about by the board tonight during our session, was a possible name change. And out of uh, uh, very flippant uh, action on my part at the uh, annual tea at Thorndale back in June, I said, well, maybe we ought to change the name of the society. Well, what is the name of our society right now? Town of Washington slash Village of Milgram. Historical Society. Try writing that on a check. <laughs> you can't do it easily. So, we're thinking about well, what else? Milburn. 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 Historical Society. There may be aspects of changing the name having to do with our 501c3 status with the state of New York. But we're investigating that thanks to Alex Marshall, who's taken on that task this evening, and we'll take it forward. But we all think we should change the name. It simply fits better. And uh, last item, just before I turn it over, is that uh, uh, Allison Meyer is hot on working in the 2015 program schedule. We set a date in early November. Uh, the board will be meeting over at Merritt Books one afternoon, and we will pick out a wonderful set of programs for your entertainment, education, and participation in 2015. It's the latest of a string of very successful years we've had. And thank you all for participating and coming to our meetings. Is, and I, do, I just do want to stress again, if anyone is interested in input on our programs for 2015, please join us on November 3rd at the bookstore at 4.30, because we love to have new, new blood and, uh, and enthusiasm. And there are lots of fun those meetings. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. So we just throw out ideas and then shake them up and see where they fall in the months and get everything we have some we have some really interesting programs on the docket yes. possible for next year. One including possibly study of women in the town of Washington and <coughs> history and contribution to our country. Which we think we think of all the aspects of how we got to where we are. Why not? So lucky. All right, let's get to our program. I'm delighted to introduce Joyce Heaton. Joyce Heaton is a good friend. Uh, and uh, a local business person. Uh, she opened her business two years and two months ago. Twenty days. <laughs> <laughs> two months, two years, two months, and twenty-three days. Who's <laughs> 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 counting? Right, exactly. That's how it goes. I asked George. I said, "Well, what's your interest in jewelry? How's it relate to history?" She said, "Well, there's so much history in jewelry." And she's about to share that with you. Delighted to have her with us tonight. Choice Thank, Thank you, Stan. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for letting me come this evening and share something that I love very much. And I just administratively, can you see this over there, or should I pull this back further? Can you see a little bit back? How's that? Okay. Hey, can you see over on the other side as well? Um, this evening I'm going to talk about uh, jewelry from 1840 through the 1950s. And what I'm doing is based on two books. I'm also going to talk about how to be a jewelry detective. And the work that I've put together is based on the books of C. Janine Bell, who is a jewelry historian. She's been on the Antiques Roadshow several times. Uh, I love her books because they're nice, neat summaries and they put things in historical perspective. I think that's very important. And just to start out, I want to tell you that jewelry motifs are consistent with furniture and clothing. Different countries had overlapping but distinct styles. Now in our current world, that's not happening because of globalization. As our cultures come together, so do our styles. Jewelry styles have been influenced by hemlines, hairstyles, and the economies. The photos that you're going to see of some uh, jewelry are actual photos from the store. It's a little bit of shameless self-promotion. Uh, but I also, they're, they're very interesting pieces, and I thought it was important so you could see things that are coming in from your neighbors, some of whom are here. Um, very interesting things coming in. So let's start with the 1860s. I'm sorry, 1840s through the 1860s. We were reaping the few fruits of the Industrial Revolution. <coughs> there were new social and economic conditions. In 1848, what happened? Gold. 
It led to the development of the railroad, which was an economic development as well. Britain was the leader in steam navigation, and they also started to do international expos, one of which was in 1851. Except for 1842 and 1848, our nation flourished. Medieval times were an inspiration. Death was a real part of life. There was a mourning etiquette. One full year of mourning, another year and half mourning. Rigid dress codes applied to widows, daughters, aunts, sister-in-laws, and cousins. And therefore, there was jewelry to accompany that. Chatelaines, which were ornamental, prestigious centerpieces that were worn sometimes on a pocket, contained a variety of household necessities, including little scissors, sewing cases with needles and thread, knives, uh, coin purses, pencils, notepads, sense bottles, and watches and keys. There was hair work jewelry, which always kind of, I don't know, gave me feel a little <laughs> they do that. Um, but it was an outward expression of innermost feelings. It was a privilege to have part of a loved one near. Bracelets were sometimes even made of children's teeth. It became a drawing room pastime. It started in Europe and spread to the U.S. in 1850. Here's the process. They boiled the hair in soda water for 15 minutes. They sorted it into lengths. They divided it into strands of 20 to 30 hairs. It was then braided, woven, looped, whatever. Once it was designed, it was sent to a jeweler who made the fittings for it. There was one particular jeweler in New York City named Lynn Hurt and Company, which was well known for their fittings for hair work jewelry. Some of the hair was actually horse hair. Hair was a very big industry. Hair merchants purchased hair for artificial ringlets, false braids, beards, mustaches, and also jewelry. Its value was three times that of silver. <laughs> Quote, it is a very modern fashion to sew, braid, and form the hair as to make not only an outside ornament of itself, but also to produce the most beautiful and delicate effect. The perfection to which this new art has been brought has led to the general adoption of these ornaments by the ladies, and they are now almost as much worn by the upper ten as are golden ornaments, and that the effect to say nothing of the pleasant ideals of thus wearing the hair of those we love and cherish is incomparably superior to metallic jewelry. No person of good taste would venture to deny. <laughs> that was from Gleason's Pictorial Drawing Room Companion, October 1853. Albert gave Victoria an engagement ring in the form of a serpent. This generated a revival of this ancient decorative motif, which is the symbol of eternal love. Materials that were used in this time frame, pinchbeck, which is an alloy of copper and zinc invented by Christopher Pinchbeck in the 1720s. It looked like gold, but was much cheaper. Cut steel. You see cut steel in some jewelry, and basically they made little riveting rosettes from metal, which they adhered to other metal, and because it was all metal, it reflected light, and it glittered. Gutta percha is actually from the sap of a Malayan tree. It was discovered during the rubber making process. It's durable and light brown or blackish in color, which makes it perfect for mourning jewelry. It was the first form of natural plastic. We'll talk a little bit more about that later on. The stones that were used, amethyst, which were plentiful and affordable. Seed pearl, set in yellow gold or pinchbeck. Bloodstone, which is a dark green chalcedony with flecks of red. And coral. Since Roman times, it was believed that coral would ward off evil and danger. It was a favorite as a christening gift. Cal, I'm not going to say this right. Calcareous skeletons of marine animals were found in abundance in Naples. And therefore, that's where a lot of it came from. What I'd like to show you now is a picture of a cameo that came into this world <coughs> consignment. I believe it to be from this time frame, but it is what we call a, long, a lava cameo, which means that it may have been produced from the lava of a volcano in, in Italy. It's, the subject is absolutely beautiful. 
The back of it has what we call a seat clasp and a tube hinge, which indicates it might be from that period of time. There all, there's only one little thing wrong with this cameo, and that is a very little chip, which is right down here. And with cameos, condition is everything. Now, if you have a shell cameo, which is going to be translucent, what you can do with it is before you purchase it, you hold it up to the light and you check it to see if you notice any cracks in it. But always check the condition of a cameo. But I just think this is an absolute beautiful example of a cameo. How large is it? And how in, in real life, it's about an inch and a half by about an inch. It's an oval. And it's, so it would be just a pin. It's a pin. And what's that? What uh, was it made of? Did you Lava. 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 Any brownish cameos are believed to be lava, carved from lava from Italy, which was another material they used for, um, for, for cameos. Okay, now we're going to move on into the 1860s to the 1889 time frame. There was an interest in archaeological finds. There were digs in Egypt, Pompeii, Crete, and Rhodes. The Civil War in 1861 changed the role of women. Women took on men's responsibilities. In 1861, Prince Albert passed. Virginia, I'm sorry, Victoria's mourning lasted for years. Edward married Princess Alexandra of Denmark. She was an extremely fashionable young lady and is known for her beautiful tall look and long neck and collars of pearls that she wore around her neck. In 1862, French designer Castellani displayed ancient motifs in his jewelry exhibition at the Great Exposition in London. What Castellani did was he found a process to do granulation in jewelry. I'll show you some of this in a photo later. Granulation are little tiny dots that when looked at all together look like it's a line. It's a very antique, old method of de decorating jewelry. By 1864, the new models are all copied from the antique and give one a very good idea of the beautiful gold and jewel ornaments of old Grecian art. There became a, an interest in women's education. In 1865, Vassar College was founded. In 1870, there was a Women's Property Act, which allowed married women to own property so a woman's holdings no longer automatically passed into her husband's ownership after marriage. What does this mean? This means that women are starting to develop their own economic means. They're able to buy jewelry. <laughs> From 1874 to 1880, we had the great expansion of the British Empire. In 1876, the Centennial International Exposition, funds for which were raised largely by women, uh, had exhibits by Tiffany, at, at which Tiffany received special recognition and won gold medals. Now comes the 1880s. We have a light bulb now, the Brooklyn Bridge, the fountain pen was perfected, the first skyscraper, the Statue of Liberty was unveiled, and there's even a Kodak camera. In 1887, it's Queen Victoria's Jubilee. Jewelry of the 1860s and 1870s was heavy, massive, and solid. Fashion was to make the waist look as small as possible, remember Scarlett O'Hara. So you had large hoop skirts and buckles to show off small waists. Necklaces were very popular then. There were thick gold chain, chains and large round jet or coral beads. A new fashion developed to wear chains that were suspended over the top of the bonnet and draped over the bust. Lockets became popular as keepsakes of those loved ones often wore. Women started wearing nets with, which held their hair back so that earrings became more fashionable. Combs became an ornament for the hair. In the 1880s, the hoops were gone and they were replaced by the bustle. The bustles were steel and metal. Hair was put up in the 1880s. In 1885, Charles Dana Gibson drew his first Gibson girl. England was coming out of mourning and there was renewed optimism in the United States. Bracelets were chain style, gold chains and lockets became passe. Roaches became fanciful and dainty, dainty, and earrings became small. From the 1860s through the 1880s, the ancient style of jewelry was worn. 
These styles were based on the motifs found in the various archaeological discoveries preceding this time frame period. Designer Castellani and his sons revived and perfected the ancient technique of granulation where small round globes of gold are soldered onto metal, resulting in patterns that look like lines. From the 1880s through the 1920s, Tiffany developed a simple six-prong setting that became known as the Tiffany mounting, as it is still today. Because of its popularity, it became part of our nomenclature. Stones that were used, jet, which is a hard coal-like material, which is actually fossilized wood. The finest jet was mined in the town of Whitby, England. It lent itself to carving and was lightweight. Now, just in interest, you can no longer mine jet in, in Whitby, England because it's in the veins on the, on the cliffs on which the town is built. And they found that it, it was actually in danger. So now, there are still people there working with the material, but they have to wait for pieces of jet to come up on the beach. They have to use recycled pieces of jet wherever they can find them. Diamonds were discovered in South Africa in 1861. Until 1871, alluvial diamonds, which were found in streams in India, were the only ones available, and also there were diamonds in Brazil. In 1870, huge opal fields were discovered in Australia. That was one of Victoria's most favorite stones. <coughs> Garnets were popular for their deep, rich color. And then in Italy, they developed another thing beside cameos, and they're called mosaics. One type of mosaic is called a petradura. And quote, these works of art are made by cutting designs out of stone, such as malachite and carnelian, and fitting them together in a black background stone. This was done so expertly, expertly, sorry, that a magnifying glass is needed to verify that the design is indeed made from pieces and not painted. That's how well these were grounded. Flowers and birds were favorite motifs. There was also piquet and tortoise shell. Piquet is where the shell of a hawksbill turtle is drilled with tiny dots or racks. And into that, they inlay gold and silver. And I'd like to just show you a photo of a pin, a couple of things that we have here. This is a, this is a, a pin that we have in the store, and if you get my emails, I've sent pictures of this out several times. This is silver on the top, and it has all different shaped diamonds, very, very old diamonds throughout. The back of it is gold. It's one of a set of three. I am assuming that it went together at some point, maybe as a corsage pin or as part of a tiara. Often, fine pieces of jewelry were made to be interchangeable and had multiple purposes. And when we talk about granulation, this is a, this is a pin that we have in the store. I don't know if you can see it, but there's very tiny, tiny dots that make up all of these lines. It's, that's the detailing work that they called granulation, which they revived during the Victorian era and was an ancient technique. Yeah, it is. It's really beautiful. It really is. Okay, let's move on to 1890 to 1917. The gay 90s. The USA is becoming wealthy and the leading industrial nation. Society's 400 had more wealth than European royalty. Entertainment, theater, and vaudeville abound. At the same time, a large number of people are living in tenements. There are union and management issues. Women were demonstrating for the right to vote. There were many more women in the workforce by 1910. Women were playing the stock market and acquiring wealth. 
Time was punctuated with expositions and eh, expositions and eh, ex, uh, ex, exhibitions, let's leave it at that, that had a unique role in art and industry by educating and inspiring the masses on other cultures and their latest trends. In 1893, there was a Columbian Expo. It featured the novice invention, electricity. Tiffany and Gorham both had their own buildings to display their work. There were 29, this is at the 1893 Columbian Expo, there were 29 jewelry manufacturers from New England included. 1901, Queen Victoria died. Prince Edward died in 1910. And it marked the end of British supremacy. At the end of the century, Western cultures were in the mood for dramatic change. Fashion became risque and exciting. Clothing accentuated the figure. The long, beautiful neck of Queen Alexandria, upon which she wore chokers of pearls, was illustrated widely and thus started a trend. King Edward was an avid horseman. The horseshoe became a decorative motif in jewelry. However, later in the same time frame, the influence of royalty and culture was waning, while the influence of entertainers began to wax. Catalog shopping began, and less expensive jewelry became available to all. As a, re as a reaction to the rapid industrialization, the arts and crafts movement developed where handcrafting and the working of designers and craftsmen became valued. For example, William Morris in England. Japanese and Oriental motifs became popular. Then we came to Art Nouveau. And I think the best way to describe this is to read the following quote. The French took the best from the past, the naturalistic designs of the 1850s, the free-flowing lines and enameling techniques from the Orient, the pride and craftsmanship of the arts and crafts movement, the sensuousness of the theme de siege, and combined them all in their own way, and voila, Art Nouveau. René Lalique opened a studio in Paris in 1885. At the Paris exhibit of 1900, all of his work was purchased by a millionaire from Germany. Sarah Bernhardt became his patron. During this time, jewelry was really an expression of the designer, and it was his or her skill that was coveted, versus the material. So often you'll see less expensive materials, but with really fine craftsmanship from this period. The materials that they used were things like horn, ivory, tortoiseshell, carved glass. Motifs included orchids, irises, snakes, dragonflies, women's head, flowing lines, plant shapes. The stones which were used included opals, moonstones, semi-precious stones, and then enameling. In 1880, L.C. Tiffany joined his father's business as, direct, as director of design. Enameling became popular. Enameling is glass-like mixture of silica, quartz, borax, feldspar, and lead. Metallic oxides are added to, to produce the desired color. These materials are ground into a fine powder and then applied to the article being embellished. Then it's heated, cooked in an oven. Very difficult process. And there are different means of enameling. Stones that were used included amber. Amber is fossilized resin. Over 50 million years ago, trees taller than the redwoods of today grew along the shores of the Baltic Sea. The glacier age caused them to be swept into the sea. There they solidified under the ice and pressure and came to be known as amber. Amber often contains insects, flowers, <coughs> seeds, and bark. The color on the, of the amber varies according to the depth of water into which the tree fell. Amber can be, be translucent, opaque, or a mixture of both. Now let's talk for a minute about pearls. Pearls are formed in mollusks. They begin when a tiny irritant enters the oyster. It reacts by secreting a substance called nacre to surround the intruder. This is a gradual buildup which eventually becomes a pearl. The color of the pearl depends on the type of mollusk and the water in which it grows. The process of culturing pearls, where this was, became a forced process, was developed by Mikimoto, whose research started in this time frame. Basically, you force the buildup of nacre by placing an irritant inside the oyster. There were also freshwater pearls that were harvested from rivers, including the White River in Arkansas. 
Um, they used Moonstones, which is a transparent feldspar. It's valued for its minimal color and its mystical look. Peridot was a favorite of King Edward VII, who thought it brought him luck. to one of the most interesting times, the 1820s to the 1830s. Roaring scandal is shocking. Post-World War I jubilance. Values turned upside down. Women won the right to vote. Bobbed hair, they took shortened their dresses, undergarments were altered, lips were painted, and some even smoked. Businesses flourished. There was an 18th Amendment, which made alcohol illegal and had the reciprocal effect of creating a mystique. Cars were available making society mobile. Works, um, new, new independence for people. There was an availability of railroad, of radio, sorry, for households, and that worked to create a common culture. Um, the workday decreased to eight hours, so there was more leisure time. Movie stars became fashion, fashion and style icons. The stock, the stock market bubbled and burst. Then came the 1930s, more somber and depressing. Roosevelt did the New Deal to try to help us, and society was working to try to escape from the sadness. There was a growing fascination with the lifestyles of the rich. Late in the 1939 time frame, there was growing hope, though. There was the World's Fair in New York City. Fashions were erratic, with hemlines up and down by this point. Hair went from long to short to shoulder. Fashion was a little boyish. Jewelry complemented dress and short dangling earrings, long ropes of pearls, lots of bracelets, sparkle and change, crystal amber and bakelite. Hats needed to be ornamented. To harken back to the history of civilization, we find always in periods of prosperity, jewelry becomes more varied and specialized in its uses where people can afford different types for different needs. The late 1930s and into the 1940s saw a reaction to the masculine look. Styles became softer. Women designers were making an impact on fashion. Paris became the center for fashion trends. Some designers combined jewelry and clothing designs. Then there was something else that was happening at this point in the world of design. The designers were branching out not just into clothing, but in all aspects of personal adornment. Quote, but what have the dressmakers to do with jewelry? Nothing, any more than they have to do with perfume or powders, gloves or hats or shoes, bags, flowers or lingerie. But all these, and a great many things besides, they now make and sell because they have found everything that a woman puts or uses in on her body while she is wearing one of their gowns enormously affects the chic of the gown. That is why women who buy a gown want the same type of lingerie, or a woman who buys Landvin sports suit wants the hat that goes with it, or any woman who believes Chanel can make a smart gown is equally convinced she can make the smart perfume to accompany it. And now, when she buys her dress, she buys at the same time and place the jewels to accompany it. So you see somewhat of a change in that business which is affecting jewelry. Since the dressmakers have thus similarly taken the designing of jewelry into their own hands, two expected developments have taken place. First, the jewels bear a much closer resemblance to the gowns that are being worn. And secondly, they started not to be real. The world of costume jewelry starts to begin. Once, not so long ago, no lady worthy of the name would have been caught dead or alive wearing imitation jewelry. Today, even the ladies who have their safety vaults full of genuine stones have also their complete regala of imitation jewelry, jewelry so gargantuan and blatant that there is not the smallest pretense it is genuine. Indeed, that is just where the fun and the chic of the new jewelry comes in. It doesn't consist in a string of pearls so tiny and so meticulously perfect that they really might be real, but in a yard or so of emeralds of a size that no real emeralds could ever be. <laughs> Nineteen forty to nineteen fifty. Nineteen forty was very much defined by World War II. 
the culture and fashion of the time, there were more women at work. They developed freedom and confidence. They had a little more disposable income. There wasn't much to spend a lot on because of war shortages, but sales for jewelry did not suffer during this time frame. When France engaged in the war, American designers developed. So the French became busy and so the Americans were able to sort of come into their own. Trousers became popular with women. The impact on jewelry. During the war, there was a shortage of metal for jewelry making, especially base metals. They could no longer get pearls from Japan and the Dutch East Indies. They couldn't get high-grade imitation stones, which came from Central Europe. Platinum, iridium, and rhodium, which are alloys of platinum, were needed for munitions. Silver was needed for soldering, and gold was not as available. Palladium, which is a metal in the platinum family, was available and started to be used. So oftentimes, if you find a piece of jewelry that is palladium, it could be from that time frame. Many jewelry manufacturers were engaged in the war effort because their employees were well suited for highly skilled precision work on equipment. So there was a slight change in what some of the jewelers were doing. Post-war, there was more money to spend. The, eight, the 1950s, when we look back on it, looks like it was a fabulous time. But it was also a time when Americans learned to live in fear. There was a GI Bill which helped to educate many people. There was a flight to the suburbs. Schools and shopping centers multiplied, and there was new middle class affluence. What was the impact on jewelry? Costume jewelry making took off. Providence, Rhode Island became the costume jewelry capital of the U.S. <laughs> jewelry took on larger proportions, like it did in the 1860s when skirts were widened. <clears throat> I'd like to show you one of my favorite brooches that we have in the store. And it's citrine and ruby, and it's a rose gold and yellow gold. And it was a style from the late 40s into the early 50s. It's quite large. It's probably four inches long and about an inch and a half wide. And you see it has the ribbons and sort of the sashes. It's almost like it's a celebration post-war. It's almost like it's, it's a, a flag or a banner or, or it's just grandiose and it's saying we're here and it's going to be good times and this is the way the world's going to be. Of course, that all changed. We all know that. But it was certainly an optimistic time frame and I think it was represented in the jewelry. What color is the citrine? The citrine is a, a golden yellow color. So that takes us through the 18... 1950s, I'm sorry. Now I'd like to talk just for a minute about how you can become a jewelry detective. Okay. This is my husband, obviously. He doesn't know how jewelry goes. <laughs> i got to fix that. It's going to bother me if I don't fix it. <laughs> Um, people go to yard sales, you come across a box of miscellaneous things, you're not sure what's inside. I can't tell you, it's like Antiques Roadshow. Sometimes people come into the store and they say, oh yeah, I picked this up at a yard sale. And we look at it and it's a real diamond or it's real gold. And there's a period, of, you know, there, there's a point at which real jewelry and costume jewelry sort of cross over. There's some very high quality costume jewelry and there's some very uh, colorful real jewelry and sometimes it's hard to tell the difference. So you need to use your senses. Your sight, your touch, your smell, your feeling, your hearing. You also add, need to add your intuition once you become practice at this. You have to ask yourself some questions when you look at a piece of jewelry. If it's a piece of jewelry that has stones, generally there's something holding the stones and those are either prongs or little tiny beads. You need to look at that and make sure are those prongs and little beads actually holding a stone or are they just there for decoration? 
If they're just there for decoration, chances are it's, it's probably a costume piece of jewelry. Like everything else, you need to turn it over and look at the back. Is the back open? If the piece has stones, and they're real stones, the back generally would be open so that light would go through which would maximize the look of the stone. So if the back is closed, it could be a very old foiled back piece, but it could also be a costume piece. You need to look at the hinges and the clasps, and you need to sort of study this a little bit. There's an old-fashioned C clasp, which is just a curl of metal that catches the pin on the back of a pin. And then there is a tube hinge. That's a very old style. The first cameo that I showed you has that type of a fastener in the back. Um, safety clasps on pins where you have the little, you know, you have the little, you put the pin in and you have the little thing that goes down over that. Mm -hmm. That wasn't developed until the 1920s. Um, you also need to weigh it, to feel it. How heavy is it? If it's spun cast metal, which costume jewelry is made out of, it's going to be heavier and thicker than platinum or white gold. White metal is made up of tin, lead, um, antimony, and cadmium. It has a low melting point, therefore it makes it easier to produce jewelry. You also want to look for marks, not just the marks of what it is, but you want to look for mold marks. You want to look on the side, on the edges. Do you see a line that might indicate it was poured into a mold? Um, the metals that were used, just so you have a, a quick idea, platinum is heavy, dense, hard, it's white, and has a grayish cast. Uh, other metals within that family, iridium, palladium, rhodium, uh, ruthenium, and osmiridium. Gold is soft. It's naturally yellow. Different countries have different markings. Before 1906, you weren't, it wasn't a requirement to put the carat down for gold. In the United States, we use 14 carat and 18 carat. In many parts of Europe, they use 585 and 750. The 585 stands for 58.5% real gold, plus the rest is alloys in the piece. The 70, 750 is 75% real gold and uh, alloys to make it the metal in the piece. Um, they add alloys to gold to make it different colors. So for example, rose gold has silver, zinc, and copper in it, and white gold has nickel and zinc. Plum gold is a designation and the reason why they came up with this designation in 1978 is because legally a jeweler can put 14 karat gold marking on a piece, but it can actually be 13.5% rather than 14. So they can, they can scam a jam a little bit there, and so they came up with this designation so that if a, plate, a piece is marked 14 karat plum gold, it is 100% 100 14 karat gold. There's no variation. The preferred method to test for gold content is, a, is with acid, and what we do is we take, you take an inconspicuous spot and you rub it on a piece of, um, of stone, and then there are different acids, and you keep, you keep putting the acid on until the, the line of metal disappears, and that tells you what carat gold it is. Um, caution with old pocket watches. Many of them feel like they're real gold because they're very heavily plated, but they're not, often not. They can even be marked 14 karat gold. Somehow they got away with it with pocket watches, and they're not truly 14 karat gold. Gold filled is actually a sandwich of gold, base metal, and then gold. Rolled gold is a term from the 18th and early 20th century, which also means gold filled, so it's gold, best base metal gold, but it's a thicker coating. And this is particularly tricky in the old pieces because you have to really find a good spot to dig in because you have to get beneath that layer to see if it really is solid gold or whether there's something underneath that top layer. If something is marked HGE after 14K or 18K, that means it's been heavily gold-plated, electroplated. 
so it's not real. Vermeil is sterling silver that has a gold base. Would you repeat what you said before about the H? HGE, usually it'll say 14K or 18K, and then it says HGE. Oh, that then means it's heavy plated. gold electroplated. Okay. So it's just a coating of gold, it's not right. solid. Right, okay. Um, Vermeil is a sterling silver with a gold, with a gold base on top of it. Base metal, when you, we talk about base metal, that's actually copper or brass. And the white metal, which they use in costume jewelry, I mentioned, is tin, uh, uh, antimony, cadmium, and a couple of other different metals. Stones that were used. How do you define a natural stone? It's created inside. I'm sorry, this is very basic, but I sometimes find it good to go back to the basics myself. So I hope, I don't know. Um, it, they're created inside the earth with a combination of certain chemicals, heat and pressure. Clues to identification are contained in the size, color, and shape of the inclusions inside the stone. Those are like the imperfections inside of the stone. Synthetic stones are made in the laboratory using the same combination of chemicals <coughs> as a real stone, but they're made in the lab. Imitation stones are made from many materials and have been made for many, many, many years, centuries and centuries, and they're made from glass and plastic, um, they've been around since the time of the Egyptians. With diamonds, there are four key things that you look at, the four C's that you hear mentioned in, in publicity and ads. Carat, which is the weight in metric carats of the stone. The bigger the stone, the more valuable. Clarity, which is measured by the amount or lack of inclusions or flaws on either the inside or the outside of the stone. The color, there's a, the Gemological Institute of America has come up with a grading system. It starts at D and goes all the way down. And the uh, it, it, best way to look at a color of a diamond, if you have one and you're not sure about the color, hold a piece of white paper next to it and look at it under a good, strong light. Uh, some white diamonds actually show tones of yellow, brown, or gray. And today they actually take some of these off-colored stones and irradiate them to make, that enhances the color. Um, diamonds come in all colors, as do sapphires. The fourth C is one that's often forgotten, and that's the cut. And the reason why the cut is important is because a poorly cut stone doesn't maximize the light going through it. So you can leave the light out and the stone lacks fire and brilliance. Paste stones. These were used in old, in lots of old jewelry. Flint or lead glass was developed in 1675. It soon became used in jewelry. One major factory was called Strauss, and it was in operation from 1730 to 1773. Paste stones were set in silver, as were diamonds. Many diamonds were pulled from these old settings and reset in other pieces of jewelry, as different styles prevailed. This didn't happen to the paste jewelry. Therefore, paste pieces are more valuable to collectors. I'd like to show you. <coughs> this is, this is a, a parure, which is a set, term, French term for set. Uh, these are paste. The only thing uh, with this is there are several of the stones that are missing. <coughs> And the backs of the earrings were converted to screw back. It's, these are actually even older. It's circa 1815. It was from uh, authorized by uh, an English historian. And uh, one thing I think you can notice here is that it looks sort of Egyptian, doesn't it? it doesn't it look a little Egyptian in terms of the style? And this, this came into the store off the street from one of your neighbors. Because we all have treasures. I know you do. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> Is that okay? <laughs> I'll keep you around. <laughs> Rhinestones we see a lot in jewelry, and the original name refers to colorless rock crystals that were found in the River Rhine. They were actually a form of quartz, and they come in all colors and are cut to imitate stones. Marcosite, you see that a lot in early 20s, but paired with onyx often and set in silver, is actually pyrite. 
glass can be any color, it can be transparent, opaque. When you look at glass, and some glass really does look like real stones, they, they really are good at knocking things off. But when you look at it in a microscope, there's sort of an orange peel effect to it, and you'll see bubbles and curved swirls or lines under a microscope. Then there are doublets and triplets, and this is where they take one layer of stone and they fuse another stone over it. They do this a lot with opals. Um, and then a triplet is actually where they take a stone and then they actually use three, they put three other, two other stones on top of it and it's all fused together. And with opals, I think one of the reasons they do this is opals are very fragile stone. And this is a way of adding strength to it. Um, we talked a little bit about jet. Uh, the, the way to test if a piece is jet is you uh, take maybe like a, an old piece of pottery, like an old um, uh, you know, plant planter that you have that's ceramic, and you, you do a line on it. If it's true jet, it should leave a black or brownish line when it is heated. And, the, and what they suggest for heating is there is a tool you can get, but you can also take a needle and stick the back of it into an eraser, and then you heat it up and then you can point it into certain things. So I'm going to talk about heating some of these things to tell what they are. I don't do that in the store, but I tell people you can do that because I don't want to, I don't want to damage anything. But when you heat jet, when you take that needle and you heat it and you put it in a little piece of the jet, it should smell like burning coal. The gutta percha, uh, once again, is made from the sap of the Malayan tree and it was discovered during the rubber making process. It's durable and impressionable. When it is immersed in hot water, or you do that little prick test, or you rub it against your skin, so if you're at a yard sale and you don't have access to anything, you think something might be good to purge it, rub it against your, your clothing and see if you can get a little friction going, then you smell it, and if it has a strong burnt rubber smell, then it, it could be good to purge it. There's something else that was used called bog oak, and that's actually oak wood that's preserved in the bogs of Ireland, and that, that jewelry usually has Irish motifs. And then there's Bakelite. Bakelite is a form of plastic that was invented in 1909 by Leo Hendrick Bakelite. Bakeland, I'm sorry. He came up with this resin while trying to develop a new type of varnish. Bakelite is phenolic plastic and can be molded or cast. Jewelry items are molded. The way to test is you immerse it, immerse it, immerse, immerse it in hot water you test it with that needle, hot needle, or the friction test, and it should smell like varnish or form formaldehyde or car carbolic acid. <laughs> okay. real, yeah. real ivory is from the tusk of the African elephant. Bone is often used to imitate ivory. Um, it has a drier, coarser look. Don't try to beat bleach or clean anything that you think may be ivory because it's the yellowing of age is actually preferred. In fact, in China, when they do imitation ivory, they often try to stain it the darker color. You have to look at that under magnification. And when you do, if, if it's real ivory, it will have cross-hatched patterns. It's also heavier than its imitations. And when you test it with nitric acid, it does effervesce. Uh, when it's heated with the hot point, it will smell like burning hair. Now let me warn you also about ivory, because we have people come into the store with ivory that they want to consign. Unless you have uh, a history, well annotated history of that piece of ivory, there are people that will come around and will simply take it because it's illegal to have it on any other means. So um, I know a dealer who was at a show and that happened. So unless you have really documented <coughs> ivory, don't just keep it or you know, I don't do whatever with it, but it's not something that can be marketed or, or sold. Coral is the skeletons of marine animals. It's found in abundance in Naples. The most prized species are, are pieces, I'm sorry, are deep red or angel skin pink. Um, the shell is easy to work in, therefore it's easy to carve them. Uh, Coral, true coral is heavier than its imitation, and it also confesses with nitric acid. Celluloid was developed in 1860, and it is a man-made plastic. 
Uh, it, it's used to imitate a tortoise, ivory, and coral, and it's highly flammable. So be careful, even if you use the hot point with it. If you take the needle and you test it, it will make a sizzling sound, and it will scrunch, and you will smell camphor. So that's how you tell celluloid. And they, they basically stopped using it because of its flammability. Okay, amber we talked about. It comes in the colors of yellow, brown, or red. It can be translucent, opaque, or both. Amber is light. When you stick a hot needle in an inconspicuous spot, it will emit a pine scent. Some Russian amber is artificial, but it contains pieces of real amber, so you have to be careful. You can test using ether, which once applied, if it's real amber, will make no change to the surface. If it's artificial amber, it will become sticky. Tortoise shell comes from the hawksbill turtle. It's the smallest of the marine turtles, weighing between 100 and 200 pounds. Tortoise shell can be easily heated and molded. And what you do is you stick a hot needle into an inconspicuous spot, and it should emit a small, strong odor of burning hair. Uh, we talked about PK. That was the tortoise shell where they made lines and they filled it with gold or silver. Mosaics, in addition to the PK, Tradura. There are also Venetian mosaics, which are pieces of glass put together to make a picture, and which is then made into a piece of jewelry. There's also Roman mosaics, which are actually little tiny glass bricks that are put together to make a picture. All of these were things that were brought back as were cameos when you went on your grand tour of Europe. You brought them back as a uh, souvenir maybe had them set here, some cases had them set in, in Italy. Um, you can test a cameo with nitric acid. There are a lot of very good imitation um, cameos out there. Uh, tiny seed pearls. Sometimes you'll see a, it, it's like it's a, a constructed piece out of tiny, tiny little seed pearls. And um, these were strung in white horse hair and, and they, were, they were made into a pattern, and then they were generally attached to a hand-carved mother of pearl backing. And this was done between the 1700s and the mid-1800s. And I did have a piece come into the store, but the person decided not to consign it. But they're really very intricate, lovely pieces. They're not very wearable at all because they're very fragile because of the hair, but they're beautiful to look at. Um, beetles, there were... <laughs> There were several Egyptian revivals over the last 150 years. Uh, some old jewelry contains real or imitation beetles. Um, things to look at with jewelry, um, there are two, two terms, fittings and findings. Fittings are ready-made pieces that a jeweler will order to fix a piece. Um, I'm sorry, I said that was finding. Did I say that was a finding? No. no. Okay. Yeah. Scratch that. A finding is a piece that a jeweler orders. So if you come into the store and you need a new head on your ring, we're going to call our supplier and get a new head and bring it in and set your stone. If it is a fitting, then it's something that has been handmade. And uh, you can tell if you look closely and you train your eye to see whether something is actually handmade. We talked a little bit about clasps. C clasp is the earliest catch. Uh, the safety was developed and was common from the 1920s on. Um, before the safety, sometimes brooches had little chains and then little pins that acted as a safety. So you had a brooch, a chain, and a little pin. Um, earrings, uh, actually kidney wires were used, uh, shepherd crooks, these actually look the way they, I'm saying them. Um, Post and frictions are relatively new. Screwbacks were developed in 1909, they're not very common today. And clips were introduced in the 1950s and 1940s, and they are still used. So those things can help you determine possibly how old something is. Bracelet catches are a little bit trickier. Um, the box clasp, where, the, where it goes into a little box, has actually the earliest form, and it's still used today. The fold over, where you where you have a piece that goes like this, and then that just goes like that. <laughs> That's um, usually on less expensive pieces of jewelry. Um, when they did the fold over, however, and there was maybe 
a safety inside, and then it closed, that's more on watches and more expensive pieces of jewelry. A uh, bangle, sometimes you'll see a bangle that's hinged and it opens, and when it opens there's like a wire inside, mm -hmm. and then you close it and it snaps. That was developed and used mostly in the 1890s. Um, those are really hard to fix, and I think probably they figured that out because I don't think they made those for that one. Today we use lobster clasps, spring rings, and toggles as closures. And there is also swivel findings that were like, they look like um, teardrops almost, and then there's a little part that moves. And usually you put your pocket watch on and it's attached on a chain. And before, that was developed in the 1840s. Before that, they actually used one that you had to unscrew and fold it out. It's really kind of awkward, but those exist. Test. When you test, what you want to do is you, you want to invest in an inexpensive loop, which is one of these. And you want to sort of train your eye. It takes a while to really get used to this. But what you do is you hold it up to your eye and you can rest your, rest your arm, your hand rather, sort of on your cheekbone. Hold it up and then you bring the piece up and look at it. That's the way. So you do it on. Keep the loop at your eye and bring the piece up until you see it in focus. Okay? Um, what I have discovered and what I like to use now is my iPhone because I have a, I can't really show you on this because I don't have anything to magnify right now. George Clooney, my daughter put that on for me. <laughs> but I have, I have a camera function. I have a little microscope right here. And so I can, I can take something and, and oh, there's my brain. See? And it enlarges it. And I find that very helpful because I can use a loop, but oftentimes when people come into the store, they don't know how to use a loop. And so this is one way I can show them things about their jewelry, like if I see a prong missing or a chip on a diamond. And diamonds do chip. That does happen. Uh, people don't think it happens, but it happens, especially on the girdle, which is the rim on the edge, because you have like, you have like a point. Um, also, diamonds will chip if you have an inclusion inside. Um, and it goes a certain way and it's close to the surface and you just hit it the right way, it'll, it'll chip and slice right off. Um, but diamonds are very hard, but yeah, people are surprised at how often they come in and they say, do you see this little thing going on here? Uh, because people don't think it happens, but it really does. So be careful with your stones. Um, when you have your loop and you're wondering, it's still hard to tell stones. Stones are very tricky. I actually defer to a gemologist who comes in every once in a while if I have a real question on a stone. Um, if you see, if you look at a stone under a microscope and you see a variance of color and more than one color, chances are it's a real stone. If it is really uniform, unless it's a really wonderful stone, it's probably a fake. Um, you need to look at the facets. Does everybody know what facets are? Facets are sort of the cut lines of the stone. You have to look at the facets. If the facets are perfect, there's a very good chance it's fake because oftentimes the stone cutter, the gem cutter, is going to cut around the natural proportions of the stone and they're not always perfect. Um, you need to look for inclusions. Does it have inclusions? And if so, what do they look like? A natural stone will have needle-like inclusions. A fake stone will have little bubbles. And if you look at a synthetic stone, it may have curved lines and curved coloring as well. It takes a trained eye, it really does. Um, Sapphires and rubies are actually all part of the same family. That's corundo. And sapphires come in every color of the rainbow. But we take those deep red pinkish ones out and call them rubies. But they're really sapphires. It's all part of the same family. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they also come in white. And so oftentimes white sapphires are put into old jewelry. In fact, I found a saw a catalog page that was, was selling filigree rings with white sapphires. So you do have to watch that in some of the older filigree jewelry. Um, 
Uh, I just I want to close with just a definition that I thought was really important because people will often say, well, how do you know what's costume and what's what's real? I mean, how do you really differentiate? And I thought this kind of summed it up. It said, fine jewelry is made to last and can be passed down from generation to generation. Costume or fashion jewelry, as it is sometimes called, is considered more temporary. Used to complement prevailing fashions, it is usually made of base metals or plastics and embellished with imitation stones. If it happens to look real, so much more the better. <laughs> <laughs> some things and um, and maybe you'll notice some clues as we go along. So let's see, we have a list here and where did I put that? Thank you. Can I ask a question? Sure, please do. <coughs> there are so many uh, chemically made stones. Yes. And you didn't mention those that can be, I guess you make them fake, mm -hmm. but they've gone out of their way to make them as real as possible. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they can be very attractive. They can be very attractive. And then, would you say they're even good enough to pass down? I would say so. For example, if you look at a lot of the platinum, oh, let me ask something about platinum. Platinum, they were not able to work in platinum until the early 1900s when they built the Suez Canal because they developed a torch that allowed them to heat platinum to the point where they can work with it. Before that, so before like 19, I don't know, 15 or 12 or something, there wasn't a lot of work in platinum because platinum is a very difficult metal to work in. So 1920s, everybody's doing platinum now. It it's, looks beautiful, has this wonderful lacy look, and often, this one is not, but you've seen this look. This is a beautiful <coughs> platinum and diamond bar brooch, oftentimes you would see accents of little blue stones, which are sold, you know, you're told are sapphires. And most of the time, those are not real sapphires. They were able to make imitation sapphires in colors that were preferred, and they were almost as expensive as real stones. They were able to cut them, so they used them plentifully. And they were often used in, in, you know, you've seen pieces like this with, you know, with mm -hmm. sapphires in them. So, yeah, I would, this is 19, I would say this is 1920. This is very Art Deco. Isn't that a lovely piece? This is probably my favorite period of, of jewelry. What period is this? That's 1940s to 1950s. Let's see if I have any other pictures here. Um, this is just a very, very pretty Victorian rope, uh, Victorian bracelet, sorry. Little seed pearls, isn't that lovely? And this is a necklace. I, we actually enhanced the color. It looks like it's an emerald, but it's actually a peridot. See, it has a little, little pearl on the bottom. Yeah. Is peridot semi-precious? Peridot is considered a precious stone. Yeah. Uh, how big is that? This is actually, if you were in the store, it's probably about an inch and a half, an inch and a quarter long. But you see this style quite a bit. Sometimes you see something called crown ears, which are like this, but then they have the attached chains on the side. How can you tell pearls, whether they're real or old or... Yeah, yeah. When I use a test for pearls, I'm sorry, I should have included that. What you do with pearls is you take the pearl and you rub it across the surface of your teeth, and if it goes over very smoothly, then it's not real. If it goes over and you feel a little bit of grit, then chances are it's real. I would also suggest looking at the clasp. You know, a lot of times the um, imitation pearls have, have strong silver clasps. If it has a 14 karat gold clasp, 
for a platinum class, you know. Also, if their pearls are knotted, because if they're knotted, then somebody's gone to expense to, uh, you know, the cost to add little knots between each of the pearl, that might also mean that it, it's, they're real. Uh, but I've seen really, really nice looking strands of pearls that are not real. Because there was a time when everybody had to have pearls, right? And that was the thing. Got them when we got married. I love pearls. But you know what? They're not in vogue so much anymore. Yeah, they what, about they about what about puppet? What about puppet bee? I'm very excited. I'm so happy to be with you. A throwback to our <laughs> Jet is it's a coal-like substance. It's a deep. It's, a, it's very light. It's a very deep color. And it was one of the stones that became or materials that became used during for mourning jewelry because it was very easy to carve. So, All right, there were a couple of people who brought things, and I had a list. I'm so sorry. I don't know what I did with the list. Someone lost the diamonds. <laughs> You might go to jail. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Is it ivory? Do you want to come up here? What I really want to know, I have three things here. Okay. What I really want to know is, is this possibly watch out you tell me. Okay. <laughs> is that possibly a woman's watch? I would say no based on the size. And I go to jail. Okay. <laughs> generally, I, generally, and I'm not a watch expert, but I think of a lady's watch as a smaller watch. Now that's a lady's watch. That's about the biggest you're going to get. They had little, littler watches that were used as on um, watch pins as lapel watches. Uh, but this is a this is more of a standard size for a lady's watch. This to me looks much more like a man's watch. And, yes, please do. That's gorgeous. Um, I have these two here. Okay. And one of these um, was my great grandfather's. And he was shot in the Battle of Fredericksburg. And the bullet knocked off the key. Oh of the watch. They both work for me. And um, the second time he was shot, he wasn't so lucky. And he was killed. And one of those was retrieved from his body. The reason I ask about this is the, the uh, it's EH is at the bottom here. Right. And the only woman in our family was was Elizabeth Hageman. Mm -hmm. There's no other H in our family. Or, and but as I went through my great grandfather's diary, um, his pal in the war was um, had his watch um, needed repair. Okay. So my great grandfather went home and we we furlough. Okay. Uh, he gave his watch to fixed. Mm -hmm. And then my great grandpa was killed. And the man's name was um, Halsey. Oh. Edmund Halsey. Okay. So that might have been the E.H. And he never, re and never returned. That very well. <laughs> 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 Are, are actually quite lovely. I, um, once again, and they're all working, by the way. Right? Yeah, which is um, this one, the one in particular, has a, a lovely ship etched in the back, which is quite lovely. And you'll see, um, I know you can't see this, I'm sorry, but 
Um, the face also is, they're very decorated. Um, my understanding about watches is the more, well first of all, if it's solid gold, it's going to be worth more. If it's large, it's going to be worth more. If it has a certain kind of a hinge, like what they call a box hinge, it's worth more. If it has repeaters and stopwatches and alarms and all that, it, it, you know, the cost goes up and up. But unfortunately, like a lot of things in the antiques world today, the clock shows, watching clock shows, people are not going out and buying as much as they were. There's not the same level of interest in the, the coming generation, unfortunately. So it's a good time to buy them and put them aside, and then maybe in another 20 years, they might be more valuable. But they're lovely watches, and thank you very much for sharing them. I appreciate that. And, and I, I'm going to hope you don't go to jail. Appreciate <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mom's the word, right? <laughs> stones. Um, I have seen synthetic amethyst, but since it was a, a less expensive stone, sometimes, oftentimes, they're real, even if it's in a metal that's not gold. Um, I just, I just want to, I, I wish you could see this, but there's beautiful faces on the side of this ring. This looks to me like it may not even, it's got, it's a white metal. I don't know if it's sterling or not, but this is an example where I talked about they, it was more important the craftsmanship than the metal that they or the material that they use. Can you show so, it on your iPad? Um, yeah, that's a good idea. Thank you. I know. It's on the side. Now I have, I'm going to cheat a little bit, I have a machine that helps me to determine if a stone is real or not. So now I'm, my guess is that this is probably, alright, I'm seeing a little, it's light for one thing. So uh, I'm also seeing a greenish tinge, which um, often means that it's, it, yeah, <laughs> it's, it, Okay, it's probably not, uh, but once again, it's, this, is a, I, this is bigger, to, too big to show you, but it's a beautifully designed piece. It almost, it looks like it was a, uh, a, I'm sorry, a pin. It has part of a hinge on the back, but I'm thinking that it is, it's not real gold. But what I'd like to do is I have a little machine here that can help me identify if it's a real stone or not, although the true way to only know if it's real stone is for the gemologist, and I'm not there yet. I'm working on that. <laughs> I have to take a whole series of courses. Let me, so we have this little stone tester in the store, and it works pretty well. Okay. Um, the needle is not moving at all for this one, but the needle is moving for this one. So this may this may be a real stone. This one I doubt. Okay, and let me just, I'm also going to loop this and just see if there's a marking on the inside. I'm not seeing a marking on the inside. It's just a lovely, if it's uh, sterling or not sterling, it's just a lovely, lovely setting. Very, very pretty. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. Does anybody else have to Should we see it? Excuse me for one minute. Okay. This is more what I, what I, you know, this is like a lady's lapel watch. Probably there was a nice pin and, and there was a, a hook behind the pin that looks like a the pin is here, and there's a thing to go across, but then there's another little piece of wire almost that curls up on the bottom of the pin. Generally, that was so that a pocket watch could be hung off the bottom of it. So this, to me, looks like uh, the size of a lapel pocket watch, I would think. It's got a lovely face. 
Um, it has a, a feel like it's it has a feel like it's gold, but once again, it could be a very. I think it's French. There's something that's on and it says, uh, yes, it's in French, Steve, cylinder, cylinder, and it says H-U-I-T-R-U-B-I-S. I would imagine that's like, uh, what is it with watches when they do? Um, you know, it's 17 joule. I imagine the rubies were used at, inside the movement, would be my guess. Oh, okay. Did you write the movies? It's eight movies. How, how old do you think it is? Well, I'm just looking at the engraving, and the engraving is it's hand engraved, and it looks quite old to me. It looks like my great grandmother. All right, that I would say it, it looks like it could be the late 1800s, early 1900s. Does that fit around yeah, that, that time frame? That yeah. Now I'm not seeing any marks for whether it is. Wait, there's some marks on the other side. Let's see this. Yeah, it's and it has a serial number. The other thing is, if you have a Waltham watch and you can see a serial number, if you take you lift the back of the watch up carefully and you'll see a series of numbers. Um, you can sometimes go on the internet and, and find a listing and it'll be by serial number and you can tell the actual year that the watch was manufactured. That's on the inside of the, of the back. Now this is marked 585, so once again it's probably European. And that means 14 karat gold and it does have a serial number. I would just make sure I had it tested to make sure it is indeed solid 14 karat gold because once again with watches they were allowed to mark the 14k when they they were you know 14k it's very soft you can see it and it has the feel and the smell of gold to me I don't know how to explain yeah. that other than I've just done it a lot and there is a serial number so it's certainly and it's got another marking at the top so it's certainly a well marked piece and it very well could be I, I suspect that it is gold. A little dented on the case, you yeah. know that, that top soft. there. Yeah, probably because it's soft. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, or it looks like it was just dented and it looks like it has a porcelain, porcelain face. Very lovely, lovely little ladies watch with the porcelain face and Roman numerals. It's very pretty. Thank you. Very Thank you. Um, well, 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 well. This is um, this is a beautiful, beautiful piece. Um, I don't even want to take it out of the box. It looks very Art Deco to me. It is a uh, large marquee shape uh, pendant. It's a uh, white metal. It says here it's 18 karat gold pendant with genuine cut amethyst cut with diamonds and pearls. And it is an absolutely magnificent piece in its own little box. But you see how linear it is? How it's very reminiscent of, of I would say, Art Deco. Is that what you sort of, you, you don't know anything about the piece? It's a beautiful piece. Can you all see that? Mm -hmm. yes. yeah. it, um, it, may be, it may be signed somewhere. It, it looks like, it, I don't know if this is the original. It, well, with a little note inside. It may not be the original box, it may be. It also looked like there were two earrings here. Okay. But when I look at a piece like this, and I'm looking at the level of detail, I'm thinking this is you know made a fine made piece by a jeweler and worth you know worth a fair amount of money. Could you show us that on the other side? Sure. See, I don't know if you can see, it's really the effect of the whole piece. Sorry, you can't really see that. You see that? It's the stones are bezel set. You have beautiful filigree work. You see it as I go down. You know, the stones were probably specially cut. Yeah, you know, I would say 1920s to 19, probably 1910s to 1920s. Just a really lovely piece. Has little seed pearl decoration. 
Yeah, it's quite it's quite nice. That's a that's a really stunning piece of great book. Is there anything else you want to know about it or no? It's it's lovely. It's very very different. Yeah, it's gold on the back and I think platinum on the top. That would be my guess. And I bet if we looked closely, we might find a maker's mark somewhere. Because it looks to me like this was uh, being made by a designer. Yeah, I don't, I don't see a mark, but that doesn't mean... Oftentimes they were like the artists, they didn't mark their pieces because you should automatically recognize their pieces because they're... You know. <laughs> that's, a, that's a fabulous piece. Thank you so much for showing that. That's, that's lovely. Great so you have oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's from that time frame. Oh, my goodness. Wow. 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 I don't see how she's wearing it. Now, does she have it? dries out and so it gets loose and that's a very very hard thing to fix oh, yeah. and, but if you sometimes you will see a piece that the cord is actually still moving so it was worn like this well the that little piece the slide was in front was in front was the loop so Irene has a picture of her grandma her grandmother with her mother and, and is this up here? And then there was another little another little pin. So she had this this was a stopper, so you could put this anywhere you wanted to on the chain to, to stop the chain. You could wear it all different ways. But this is how it is in the picture. She had a little pin and this was pinned on. It was probably pinned maybe two or three inches so she could still open this and see it. So Thank you. That's great. Yeah. And here's a picture. You can see, I don't know if you can see that. See it? That's a nice piece. And Ginny brought in, let me just do one thing here first. Ginny Augerson brought in a couple of things. Thank you, Irene. Great. Love seeing that. Again. <laughs> um, Ginny brought in a couple of interesting things. There's a uh, a white, a bone-colored bracelet that I don't know if it's real ivory or not. It's very, very light. Um, we'd have to look at this under magnification. What I did notice is there's two lines where it looks like it was joined together. Um, I don't think it's bone. I think it, it's, if it's not ivory, it may be like a celluloid material. Um, she also has these two little earrings that have little tiny gold, what we think are gold nuggets on the inside, they would need to be tested with uh, the acid test to see if they really are gold. I think they, they probably are. Um, but what's interesting to me is there's these little flowers around them, and Ginny said these were brought from Alaska. So, you know, the question is, what is this? Is this shell, maybe, or is it um, some sort of a ceramic, or, or it might have some significance to the state of Alaska that we don't know about. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Well, 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 oh, okay. Maybe that some jewelry that I've gotten. Um, thank you so much. That's great. Which is very carved. You can carve that. It's like a whalebone, right? It is a whalebone. Okay, so that makes it even more interesting. Um, and next to that we have a cameo. And um, Ginny and I looked at this before we started to talk. And what we noticed under the iPad is that it's very smooth and you can't see any jagged lines at all. So my assumption is that it was not hand carved. 
Um, it was probably made to, you know, once people came back from Europe with these cameos, everybody wanted a cameo. And Wedgwood actually made a cameo. Sometimes you see a deep blue background cameo or deep pink. And they're really quite lovely, but they're imitation cameos. And there was sort of a whole art form that developed around that. And this is really lovely because um, it almost looks like, if it's, if it's plastic, it almost looks like they tried to make it look like girl wood on the background. Um, or it might even be a light wood. I, I don't know, but it's just a really very lovely toned cameo. So we've learned a little something about these pieces this evening, but we have to look at them more closely. Out this way. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Oh, also, uh, Jimmy brought in some of, there's a ring, a bracelet, and a pin. And this has very much the sort of Danish, Norwegian style, George Jensen, David Anderson, uh, 40s and 50s era. But we discovered that this was made, uh, it was called Viking Craft, and it was made in the United States. So our assumption is that maybe there was a silversmith that came to this country and worked for a US com company, or this was such a popular style someone in the U.S. decided to knock it off, which is, but it has that beautiful look, you know, that big, you know, with leaves and foaming lines and just really fun. Was there anything, somebody else?